The first speaker is Elzbieta Gonciak. You are a research professor at the Institute for the Study of International Migration at Georgetown and editor of International Migration, a peer-reviewed scholarly journal devoted to research and policy analysis of contemporary issues affecting international migration. Formerly, she held a senior position with the Office of Refugee Resettlement, ORR, and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She's taught at Howard University School of Social Work in the Social Work with Dipla Displaced Populations Program and managed a program area on admissions and resettlement of refugees in industrialized countries for the Refugee Policy Group. Then we have uh, Elizabeth Ferris, who is research professor and director, as it, acting executive director, or executive director? Okay, <laughs> she does a lot of work, in other words, for, for I hope, much reward. Um, research professor at the Institute for the Study of International Migration. So we're happy to have uh, two professors from ISIM at Georgetown and a non-resident senior fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. She joined ASIM in fall 2015 after serving for nine years as senior fellow and co-director of the Brookings Project on Internal Displacement and as an adjunct professor in Georgetown School of Foreign Service. She's co-author of The Consequences of Chaos, Serious Humanitarian Crisis, and the Failure to Protect. Brookings Institution, which considers the long-term economic, political, and social implications of series displaced and uh, displaced and offers policy recommendations to address the humanitarian crisis. Um, the next two speakers are both my colleagues at Georgetown. Uh, Kristen Sechergy is a senior research fellow at the Bridge Initiative, a research project on Islamophobia at Georgetown. Her research focus includes the radicalization of Muslims, Islamophobia as a form of white supremacy, and the performance of Islamophobia. She has published essays in Al Jazeera English, the London School of Economics blog, Feminist Studies in Religion blog, Huffington Post, and Muslim Girl. She's been featured in Reuters and on CBS Evening News um, and WIPR's, uh, NPR's Baltimore affiliate. She received her graduate degree from American University in Ethics, Peace, and Global Affairs. My colleague, Asa Tiraifi, um, who is events manager of this, as I am outreach coordinator, um, she <coughs> joined the CCIS events as events coordinator in January 2017 and brings to her position over four years of experience in event planning and communication and advanced fluency in modern standard Arabic and the Sudanese, Arabian, Egyptian, and Levantine dialects. She also does simultaneous translation um, on the fly. <laughs> Mrs. al Tiraifi is a graduate of American University School of Public Affairs with a BA in Law and Society. She's interned at Al Jazeera English, served on the steering committee of the Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, and interned for Green Door Behavioral Health, DC's second largest nonprofit. Her research interests include legal theory, philosophy, Afro-Arab identity, and media studies. So please convene the panel. Thank you, Susan, and th thank you, Rochelle, for inviting me. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, so uh, in all these long introductions, I think the identity that I am most proud of is really actually being a refugee myself. I came to this country some 30 plus years ago from a totalitarian regime in Poland and still hold that identity on my sleeve uh, proudly. So I not only study refugees, but I also have lived um, and continue to live the refugee um, life. It doesn't quite leave you ever. Uh, but today I want to talk about, um, and I, I only work on the Mac, so if I screw up here, um, we'll see. So, as you very well know, you know, so today I want to talk not about the refugees that are here, but the refugees that are not <laughs> in Poland <laughs> and Hungary and what they do in terms of, you know, the, the fear of the refugees that might come because the EU directive tells people that they should be accepting uh, refugees, what it does to the society. And I want to, since we're amongst teachers and, you know, uh, people that work with young people, um, I want to focus on youth. There's many other dimensions and aspects to the same topic that, you know, I could bring um, up. So, as you know, the um, the 
the refugee, the refugee, the so-called refugee crisis that we have seen, you know, on our TV screens and and, and that kind of stuff, resulted in a rather heated public debate, um, especially you know surrounding the refugees who are uh, Muslim and what kind of possible threat they might pose to the so-called Christian Europe um, and the national identity of these different you know, nation states. Um, in Europe. That debate has been especially fervent um, in the Visegrad countries. Um, <clears throat> so Poland, Hungary, uh, the Czech Republic, um, um, Slovakia. But I want to focus on two, on, on Hungary and my native land, um, uh, Poland. As you remember, you know, I'm, I'm going to just have some pictures in the background. This is where Kelety, which is the main railroad station in Budapest, you know, all of a sudden we see all these uh, refugees. It was an interesting time because while the government was just saying, you know, go away, go away, uh, move on to, um, to Germany and that kind of stuff, people did stay for a few weeks and the while the government was not doing anything, the civil society really rose to the occasion. Um, you had makeshift um, clinics, you had, you know, recreation activities for little children and all of that, um, you know, going on uh, there. <clears throat> but um, there's actually very few accounts in Hungarian newspapers of what was happening at that time because um, um, Orban, or the Viktator, as the Hungarians call him, um, forbid. Uh, journalists to cover uh, this. So most of the accounts that we have are um, in newspapers uh, you know, outside Hungary. Uh, there were obviously also things going on at the border. This is one uh, picture in, um, on the Serbian border in Roske. Um, <clears throat> and the riot police, you know, kind of when I went to the border, it was very reminiscent of the riot police in Poland uh, during martial law. <laughs> you know, same kind of um, kind of attitudes. In October of uh, 2016, uh, Orban um, <clears throat> decided to have a referendum whether the EU directive to accept refugees in Hungary, although you know they were supposed to take very few, um, should be obeyed or not. And <clears throat> this there was a campaign. I was, I was in Hungary at that time uh, teaching at the Central European University. And uh, uh, the, the slogan for the referendum was, do you want Brussels to rule us, or do you want Budapest to make their own decisions? The attendance, um, you know, the participation in the referendum was dismal. Um, there were all sorts of you want something humorous, Google the two-tailed dog party and see <laughs> what kind of YouTube videos they put on how to boycott the referendum or how to burn or destroy the ballot and, and all of that. Uh, the referendum did happen you know, by Hungarian law. 52% of the citizenry uh, have to participate, eligible citizenry have to participate. Only something like 21 participated. But yet, you know, the majority of the minority said no to Brussels, yes to Budapest. Um, so he proclaimed this as a victory. You know, there were fireworks in the national colors over the Danube. There was like big, huge celebrations. But it, that really doesn't, uh, you know, mean anything. At that time, I was also monitoring with my um, uh, Hungarian-speaking PhD student. Uh, I was monitoring all sorts of social media to see what people were posting leading to the referendum and then after the referendum. So you have some examples, you know, <clears throat> Of, of what people were saying. So I'll say, no, I will vote no because I want to live in Hungary as a Hungarian. I don't want Muslims as my neighbors, and so on. And you can imagine this kind of rhetoric was very, very, very prevalent. It's like a, a huge fear of the other, of the unknown, of because they haven't touched or met or shook hands <laughs> with a Muslim since the Ottomans. Um, and even then, who knows whether they were shaking hands <laughs> uh, with them. So, so there was this, this really anti-Muslim you know, uh, rhetoric that was very pervasive uh, there. Um, the, they were using religion, and they were using, they imagined um, 
um, um, vision of how women in Islam are being treated as the um, the the rationale for no we can't have them because you know look how badly they treat the women and you know um, their religion would not fit the um, Christian Hungary or Christian Poland. Well, um, <clears throat> you know, Hungarian, Hungary is one of the most secular countries in Europe. So in terms of churchgoers and that kind of stuff, we're really not talking about very religious people. Uh, but yet for that debate, that Christian identity all of a sudden became uh, uh, quite, um, uh, quite big. Of course, you know, just like 45 here, uh, Orban there, uh, did um, also um, physically things to uh, push people back or not to allow them to come in. So you have the concertino wires on the Hungarian-Serbian border still there. Um, and, and this is my favorite. Um, so the, there is big border, you know, the, the, the border patrol is quite large for a country that's very small, 8 million people only, and, you know, puny geographically, <coughs> uh, space-wise as well. Um, but they started hiring um, those border hunters. So p young people, especially, you know, young men who uh, were incentivized in terms of really good uh, salaries, you know, free cell phones with really good cell phone plans and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff to be de facto the, the equivalent of our Minutemen. You know, to, to kind of take matters in their own hand. Although, unlike the Minutemen, they are sanctioned by the government, but they are not you know, people that rose in the ranks of law enforcement or art, the military or anything like that. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this got a, a big attention. The recruitment little stands were all over, you know, uh, Budapest. And every time you passed by one, there were at least two or three young men, you know, asking about, so what are the conditions, what's the training, uh, what that kind of, uh, kind of stuff. And then the final, so I was there in the fall of 2016. By December of 2016, because Hungary has had, you know, not a robust refugee um, a program, but had a refugee program. Um, the Bosnians from the Bosnian conflict, from the Kosovo conflict, for sure, but also, uh, you know, um, from other uh, parts of the world. So this is Bicke. Bicke is a suburb of um, Budapest, and there is a really cute museum that the refugees who had over the years, you know, um, stayed there, created, and you buy the artifacts that are there, you can tell where the refugees are, were from. So they were not just the white Bosnians and the white Kosovars, <clears throat> but there were others as well. Lots of African money, coins, you know, artifacts, uh, embroidery, you know, that kind of stuff. But these camps that, I mean, not a luxurious hotel, but decent. Um, so plumbing, you know, heating, uh, those kind of um, arrangements got closed, and people were pushed to container um, a kind of uh, things very far away from. And I mean, Hungary is very rural still. You have, you know. Budapest, Debrecen, Page, <laughs> in terms of cities. Everything else is quite rural or quite small town. So, um, you know, not only the, the physical conditions were worse, but also access to schools, access to anything, you know, access to volunteers, <laughs> to that kind of stuff was obviously diminished. And the Hungarian, just regular uh, people that I interviewed were saying, well, this is his MO, that he always, um, does that and puts people in progressively worse and worse conditions, hoping that that would stop any movement of people who would want to knock on, on Hungary's door. Um, <clears throat> since we're talking about um, youth, you know, the, <clears throat> the part that, uh, to be very honest, both in Hungary and in Poland that surprised me the most when I started looking at this was that, you know, as a person with a gray hair, I thought, okay, so older people are more conservative, right? We are set in our ways, and, and maybe, 
maybe amongst the, the older people, there would be more anti-immigrant and anti-refugee sentiments. But it was quite the opposite amongst very, very young people. So this is a, a, a survey done by a German foundation that looked at 15 to 24-year-olds in several European countries. And you can see, you know, Hungary is, is here. So three quarters of young Hungarians and three quarters of young Poles say no to refugees. Um, they have not looked in the survey at the demographic character, other demographic characteristics, so like levels of education and that kind of stuff. From my interviews, it transpires that most of the people that would be you know, represented by this, most of the people that take to the streets with all these national uh, symbols are people who barely finish high schools, and, and or um, college dropouts, so not extremely high educated people, because then you have, you know, among the 25 percent or the 27 percent in both countries, university students, PhD students that actually start pro-refugee kind of uh, programs and try to, uh, you know, um, do some advocacy and that kind of stuff. Here's another one, uh, and, you know, because the. The whole it, during the referendum in Hungary, but also in Poland, um, the issue of security. And you very well know that you know we are securitizing migration more and more, and thinking that uh, anybody that is from somewhere else and moves across international borders poses a threat to uh, national security. So this was the question, and you can see that there is you know um, um, the the green ones are uh, the bars. The green bars are the ones we're interested in here. They do. A Agree. So 60 percent, 70 percent, you know, people agree that yes, uh, refugees would pose a threat to security. And of course, in neither in neither countries, any terrorist attacks happened. You know, not that there are terrorists among refugees, but if any of you went with this kind of silly logic, well, nothing happened. <laughs> so why are you so afraid? You know that um, my husband, who speaks and reads Hungarian newspapers, as we were driving here, he was saying, you know, uh, the the front page of the um, Budapest um, uh, newspaper today says that Hungary is the safest country in the world <laughs> because they close the doors. So we're really talking, you know, because I posed the question to many of the people that I interviewed. I said, okay, if there was a larger diversity of refugees, you know, Muslim and um, Christian and Buddhist and, I mean, you name it, um, would the attitudes be different? And some people said probably that the, the sort of national imagination is that all refugees are Muslim, and therefore that all refugees are you know a threat. So I looked at you know this is Islamophobia without, without Muslims. It is just like anti-Semitism without Jews. Um, so the, in Hungary, very few. Uh, according to the stati you know, official statistics, 5,500, um, but 70% of them uh, declare themselves to be Hungarian. Um, only some smaller percentage you know, to be Arab by ethnicity. When you look at sort of, you know, we're talking the Ottoman Empire way back when. And before you say, well, let's not talk about that deep history, in that part of the world, we all live in the past. So something that happened in the 1400s is as important as something that happened in 1989. <laughs> um, but, you know, like the, the last mosque was built 500 years ago. Um, and, um, you know, Hungarians seem to be the, the ones that are the most anti-Muslim uh, on, um, on the whole continent. In Poland, um, here's the, the 14th century. So we have Tatars, and we call them Nasi Tatarzy, meaning that it's a very accepting phrase. Those are our Tatars. <laughs> <You know. clears throat> um, this goes back to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth when we were like the largest uh, uh, place. Um, I, when I was a young assistant professor in Poland, uh, I used to take my uh, anthropology students to Kruszyniany and Bohoniki, which is in the northeast part of Poland, where you have whole villages where three religions live together peacefully. So you have the Tatars who are Muslim, you have the Russian Orthodox, and you have the Polish Catholics. 
Um, and the funniest part is that the clerics compete with each other, but in a kind of um, nice way, <laughs> and they try to do for their respective congregations similar kind of things. So if the Polish priest, uh, you know, um, does visits people uh, uh, around Christmas, the batyushka and the imam say, "Why not us?" Yeah, we'll go, all of us. We'll have a party. You know, we, we'll have the kind of stuff. So that's the history that people always you know, proudly talk about and, and that kind of stuff. But then we also had in the um, uh, you know, 70s uh, quite a few Syrians, I mean quite a few, Syrians, Ethiopians, and Turks who came on um, educational exchanges. So now, depending on who is estimating, you know, we say that we have about 25,000 to 40,000 Muslims. But when you look historically again at the relationships, uh, so, you know, during the Ottoman Empire in Hungary, the relationship was actually rather peaceful. Uh, the Hungarians kind of, not very revolutionary. They lost every battle that they've ever fought. The, even the national anthem says, we poor Hungarians, we never won anything. <coughs> it does. Um, uh, so, so there is none, this, none of this historical resentment you know, that would kind of harp on the Ottomans and, and say, oh, well, you know, um, they were so bad and all of that. In Poland, on the other hand, you have, um, you know, I don't know how much Polish or European history you know or you teach. Um, so uh, Jan III Sobieski was a king in the 1400s as well of the Battle of Vienna, right? So he um, pushed from the gates of Europe, those Genghis Khan you know, people <laughs> and all of that. And that battle, especially among young people, on t-shirts, on, you know, on different uh, posters and that kind of stuff is, is really ingrained in, um, in the head that we, we now, especially the, the um, male youth say, we now need to be like Sobieski and fight those Muslims, you know, because we have done that once and, um, um, and um, saved Europe uh, from the invasion. So, so we should be doing that now. So it's kind of, I mean, we are talking five, six hundred years <laughs> ago, but yet that is being used um, uh, in that. So you have, you know, I mean, I could have an hour of um, pictures just to show you um, what, you know, how the, this kind of a sentiment is non-verbally also expressed. Um, so, um, you know, no to the dictatorship of, of, of EU. I think both countries would gladly, you know, now the Venice Commission is scrutinizing both countries, but I think the governments of, um, the respective governments would gladly be kicked out of, of the EU. And fine, N not necessarily the people, <laughs> because, you know, the economic boost that being part of the new accession countries that brings to both countries would be felt, you know, very, uh, very deeply. Um, this all, you also have to look at the other dimension is, you know, who is a Pole, who is a Hungarian? Um, so in that part of the world, people have a very primordial uh, notion of what it means to be a Polish or what it means to be Hungarian. So you, both your mother and your father have to be Polish, you know, it's, it's by blood. Uh, you have to speak the language. You have, in, in Hungary, even more so than in Poland, because Hungary will say, for example, in, for children, for refugee children in education, they'll say, well, you know, how do we teach the literary or the cultural canon to the children for them to really be Hungarian. It's not very uh, different from France, <laughs> where they also want to do a little bit of um, you know, of that. Um, in Poland, I mean, and and also the language is weird, uh, because um, for for those of you who you know don't know that part of the world, <laughs> God knows where those Hungarians came from. Yeah, she's telling me the end. No, 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 no. <laughs> zero. <laughs> I only see big zero. Um, <laughs> And, and they are also saying, well, who in their right mind would want to learn this weird language that only eight million people speak? You know? And that is so very different from anything else. So it is apparently uh, you know, related a little bit to Finnish and then more distantly to Korean. 
So. Okay, so we heard. My husband speaks it. He speaks two of the most useless languages outside English, uh, <laughs> Navajo and Hungarian. Where can you get with that? But uh, here, th this is a flag. This is not a Hungar contemporary Hungarian flag. This is the Arpad House flag, which goes to the 10th century. And the young people, again, are picking up that flag. So on the Hungarian parliament, uh, for example, you know, there's the contemporary uh, Hungarian flag. There is this flag, no EU flag. Although, you know, still part of the EU. Poland the same. You have these very young people doing all sorts of demonstrations, not per se against immigrants, but immigration is always you know, part of it. So this says Poland for Poles, Poles for Poland only. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the definition, uh, there's a very um, cool and very uh, famous Polish citizen who is originally from Senegal. He speaks better Polish than I do. And, <laughs> um, and he always says, you know, what about my daughters? That's the only place they know. This is the only language they speak. You know, they speak French, but they speak French as a second language. It's not a language that they speak at home and that kind of stuff. So am I not Polish? I have the passport to show it. And I was on a panel with him, and the audience was saying, well, you are a citizen of Poland, but you are not Polish. OK, so you can maybe become, by law, a part of the society, but you're really not ours not Nash hmm? um, at all. Um, the, I don't have the time here, but you know, the, the youth activities, the marches, the um, you know, display of all these kind of slogans are also very much endorsed by the Polish church. Um, the, as I said, you know, Hungary is quite secular, but the Hungarian Reformed Church is now looking to the Polish Catholic Church and saying, well, we should be supporting our youth as well in these kind of things. So there is this schism in the Polish Church where some of the um, members of the Episcopate, which is you know, the highest um, part, um, will say, no, 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 we should really listen to uh, Pope Frank, right? Because he reminds us uh, about welcoming the stranger and, and all of that. But others will say no. So they will invite, for example, to mass uh, and bless it. You know, um, when I talk to my old relatives, my uncle who is almost 90, so oh, this is like during the war. Um, um, that they all bless a very nationalistic na neo-Nazi kind of an organization and allow them to bring their flags and you know they um, come in the uniforms that are very brown like the uh, Hitler Jugend, it's the same kind of color and that kind of stuff. So you have you know the the, the tension also within uh, within the church. Um, in both countries, you know, in Polish we say. Um, Zapomniał wuj, jak cielęciem był. The the bull has forgotten when it was a calf, a little calf, right? So here, 1956, when Hungarians in this country, we airlifted 32,000 Hungarians, mainly students and um, highly skilled professionals, members of um, um, of the scientific circles. It was the American uh, Academy of Sciences that was actually the resettlement um, organization, if you didn't know uh, of that. And we never heard about these people because they were matched one-to-one -one with mentors you know, in the same professions and that kind of stuff. This is my favorite one because this is Polish refugees during World War II in Iran, where Iran accepted, and it's a Muslim country, right, uh, accepted uh, about 40 to 50,000. You know, there was war, so nobody was counting. Uh, I suspect that maybe uh, there were even more. And somehow people are, people who live in the history, in the past, on one hand, selectively forget certain parts of history. And I have just one, one more. This is one of those Newsweeky kind of uh, magazines, you know. So um, what it says is the, the, uh, the Muslim rape of Europe, right? And shows this blue-eyed, blonde, uh, stereotypical, not all Polish women have blonde hair uh, either, uh, you know, woman with the, uh, the arms. This, this happened right after 
the alleged um, attacks in German cities on, you know, remember the Christmas, you know, kind of thing, and who knows who it really was, and that kind of stuff. So here you're using women, the gender, in, with religion, right? So the, the Muslim women are so poor because they're so oppressed and you know, uh, we should just help them. But we cannot get the Muslim men here because look what they're going to do to our women. This all in the context of in both countries where gender issues down the drain. So um, you know, right now the, uh, Poland is going to mimic El Salvador, and we will have the most severe anti-abortion laws that both a woman who has a miscarriage and the doctor who perhaps performed a DNC after she had the miscarriage can end up in jail. You know? So you are co criticizing some other part of the world or, or a religion for maltreatment of they women, but yeah, we are doing so great by our women, right? Um, and um, um, the, the uh, Polish, the con con uh, current ruling party also voted against um, um, passing the legislation um, uh, on domestic violence because that will eradicate the traditional Polish family. Thank you. Okay, hey everybody, my name is Beth Ferris, and I'm going to talk about a few of the current dilemmas facing work with refugees, uh, both in protection and assistance. But you know, Elspeth, I was in Tanzania a couple of uh, weeks ago, and there they were very proud of the fact that they welcomed Polish refugees during World War II, and there's a Polish cemetery in, in Dar es Salaam for Polish refugees. It's amazing how dispersed people can become. But desperate people do desperate things and make journeys that don't make a lot of sense in a rational, in a rational world. You know, I think first of all, the growing number of refugees is a sign that there's something terribly wrong with our world. People don't leave their homes and communities at the drop of a hat. They leave when they're forced to, uh, whether it's staying within the country or crossing an international border. So as we look at the relationship between humanitarian dilemmas and what we heard earlier this morning about the lack of political solutions to too many crises in the world, the relationship is very clear. We see the situation of children. That little boy has written on his chest, Syrian kids, not animals, which was taken on a, on a boat. Um, this is a, a scene from Bulgaria in 2013 where you had refugee camps again appearing in Europe. We saw, uh, some of us saw a film over lunch showing the, the, the plight of, of Syrian refugees and many others who were literally walking across Europe in search of protection. And then we have long-term refugee crises that don't hear much about them, they're not in the news, but the number of refugees who are living year after year in displacement, often in appalling conditions, in conditions where there's very little hope. And everywhere around the world, borders are closing. This is a scene on the Turkish-Syrian border of Syrians trying to escape to get into Turkey as the violence escalated. And today, all of the borders bordering Syria are virtually closed. I mean, Syrians are trapped inside the country. If you look around the, the Turkish-Syrian border, you see thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Syrians living in makeshift camps because they are not allowed to enter. Um, both Jordan and Lebanon closed their borders earlier. And so, you know, we think about refugees, you know, being a refugee is a terrible thing. You talk to any refugee and it is a terrible thing to be a refugee. But people who were trapped inside a country, people who are cowering in basements as the bombs fall, who cannot escape, are much more vulnerable 
much less media coverage of what is happening in those basements right now in parts of Syria, as people can, simply cannot escape. Um, and so as we think about refugees, yes, they're, they're vulnerable and they need protection, they need assistance, and they need a chance more than anything else. But the people who are trapped inside their countries are often more vulnerable, more difficult to access international assistance or, or any kind of aid. No government in the world wants people turning up unannounced on its borders. That's true of the United States, it's true of Central Europe, it's true of most countries in the Middle East who have extended tremendous hospitality to refugees. But there's always this security concern. Who are these people? Why are they coming? Are they all Syrian refugees or are there other elements inside? So no government in the world wants people turning up unannounced on its borders. Displacement for individuals is first of all a protection strategy. When the war gets too close, when conditions get too bad, you grab your children, your family, whatever you can pack up and you leave. It is a normal protection strategy. It's been used for thousands and thousands of years in every region of the world. It's a direct consequence of conflict, and yet displacement itself has consequences. It has consequences for the individual who's forced to flee, has consequences for the countries that receive them or host them. You know, a parenthesis, I really don't like the word host countries. You know, when I host my friends for dinner, I invite them over and we have a nice dinner and I expect them to go home at the end of the evening. But many of the host countries hosting refugees didn't invite them to come, don't have an expectation that they will leave after a certain amount of time. And so while many countries and communities and individuals are incredibly welcoming and hospitable, you know, it's not a, a conscious choice for most of them to welcome refugees into their community. So some of the dilemmas I'll talk about are IDPs, and Rochelle mentioned those for, for those of you who are here this morning, internally displaced persons. You know, refugees by definition are an international issue. They have crossed an international border. Therefore, there's international attention. But when people are displaced within the borders of their own country, by exactly the same factors that cause refugee flows. When they stay within the borders of their country, the assumption until recently has been that's the responsibility of the government, of the concerned government is responsible for those displaced within the borders of their own country. Unlike refugees, because you know it is an international issue and the whole international refugee system grew up because of a desire by the international community to deal with refugees in a way that isn't paralleled by concerns with those displaced within the border of their country. A huge dilemma right now are what are called a mixed flows. That's a very, it's kind of an ugly word, but a mixed flow would be people fleeing because of, of conflict, because of persecution, but also because of a desire for a better life, maybe want opportunities. You can think about an airplane where there'll be lots of people on the plane traveling for completely different reasons. You've got tourists and business people and students and someone going to see their grandmother. You've got lots of people on the same plane. The same thing is happening in the Mediterranean today where those boats will have people who are traveling for different different reasons. And under international law or international system, the reasons people are traveling, the labels that are put on them make a big difference as to who is allowed to enter, who is allowed to stay, and who is told, sorry, you're not on our list of priorities, go home. Closing borders I've mentioned, you know, we have a a stereotypical image of refugees as living in camps. And maybe almost half of the world's refugees do live in camps. But most of the world's refugees and most of the world's internally displaced persons are not living in camps. They're living dispersed in urban communities or small towns or on the margins of big cities. Uh, most refugees would prefer not to live in camps because they're kind of artificial constructs. Uh, Turkey has some of the, has the world's best refugee camps. And yet Syrian refugees in those camps are, are 
can't wait to get out and to live much more normal lives. But in camps, there's some accountability. You don't have famines in refugee camps because somebody's in charge. There's always some kind of health care. There's always some kind of primary education. But for people dispersed around, around the country in our urban centers, there's nobody in charge, if you will. Nobody to make sure that school-aged children are in school or that pregnant women have access to prenatal care because they're in the community. And oftentimes, refugees living dispersed in communities don't want to be identified. They like being anonymous. It's a source of protection to blend in, don't draw attention to ourselves. And yet the visibility of refugee camps is, um, is striking. Uh, and Zatari, one of the largest refugee camps in the Middle East with um, over 100,000 Syrian refugees in Jordan, has become a, a media destination. The first time I went was in 2013 with a UN group. We arrived at 9 a.m. We were group number 28 to arrive that morning. There were Korean filmmakers and Swedish parliamentarians and all kinds of groups. And it was easy to see refugees when you can go to a camp. It isn't so easy when they're dispersed in the population. So though camps have lots of disadvantages, they do have the advantage of drawing attention to the presence of refugees. And then also, as Rochelle mentioned this morning, the, the dilemma of protracted displacement. You know, the media coverage is very fickle. International attention is fleeting. You know, uh, you can already see the concern with Syrian refugees is starting to fade as the Rohingya crisis in Bangladesh and other crises go to the front of our newspapers. But even when the TV cameras move on and the international attention dwindles, the refugees and the IDPs are usually still there. As we heard this morning, the Re 1951 Refugee Convention has a clear definition of refugees, it's a legal definition. Countries that have ratified the convention, there are about 145 of them, promise not to send refugees back to places where their lives are in danger and to extend certain rights to them. So there's a clear definition for who is a refugee. Imperfect though it is, it's clear, it's legal. There's a convention which sets out the obligations. And there is a UN agency, UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, which is given the mandate to protect and assist refugees. All refugees except Palestinian refugees living in the five areas of operation where, as we also heard, UNRWA is operational. UNRWA's definition of refugees, which we, I think Rochelle showed also this morning, is not a legal definition. There is no convention. It's a working definition by, by UNRWA. Those are different legal statuses to be Palestine refugee and a refugee from anywhere else in the world. The two organizations have different mandates, different ways of operating, different cultures. Um, UNRWA is the UN's largest agency with over 30,000 employees, 99% of whom are Palestinian. Um, UNHCR much smaller in terms of staff, but much more diverse in terms of their nationality. In contrast, IDPs forced to leave their homes because of violence, conflict, persecution, human rights violations. There is no convention. There are these general non-binding guiding principles on internal displacement just adopted. No, they weren't even adopted. They were presented to the UN 20 years ago. There's no single UN agency charged with dealing with them. But there are twice as many IDPs as refugees. Over 40 million IDPs compared with about 21, 22 million refugees under UNHCR's mandate and another 5 million under UNRWA. So twice as many IDPs, but the system isn't there. There isn't an agreed definition. There isn't a body of law. There isn't a UN agency. And in fact, under international law, it's the responsibility of the government of the country in which people are displaced, even if that government caused their displacement. So in Syria now, over 7 million IDPs, we think. But in Syria now, the responsibility for IDPs is the Assad government responsible for making sure they're safe, 
making sure they have access to services. And in many countries, you see this inherent tension between a government that's caused at least some of the displacement being responsible for their well-being. If you look at the numbers of IDPs and refugees, in this table, the orange are the number of IDPs, the blue the number of refugees. You know, the number of refugees has you know, kind of gone up and down over the years, but it's usually been you know, between 15 and 20 million. But the real growth has been in IDPs, probably in part because those borders are closing. When people have to leave and they can't make it across the border, the number of internally displaced persons increases. So that's one dilemma. How do we deal with IDPs? A second are, what about those who don't qualify as refugees, but who may be vulnerable? Many of those now crossing the Mediterranean are from Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan and Ethiopia and Eritrea and Western Africa. Many people are taking that journey because they cannot survive at home. They don't qualify as a refugee. They're not fleeing persecution for one of the five reasons, but they may not simply not be able to, you know, desperate poverty is not a, does not qualify you for refugee status, even though many of the people now making those very risky journeys are doing so because they cannot survive at home. Our international laws don't, don't recognize that. Under international law, all migration, except refugees, all migration is assumed to be voluntary. That's under international law. So our laws haven't kept up with the realities of why people are forced to move. Just uh, then the impact of refugees on host countries. You know, the pattern seems to be initial welcome hospitality, but as time goes on, that hospitality begins to wear thin. Just like when your cousins stay for two nights or two weeks and a little longer, you know, it gets a little. I remember talking to a Lebanese woman in the Baca Valley, an older woman, a widow, um, obviously not a wealthy person, and she said, you know, last year there was a Syrian couple and a, with a two-year-old child who came and they had, they had no place to stay. There were no, there were no camps, uh, formal camps in, in Lebanon. They, had no, and they said, you know, can you help us? And she said, well, I have a, a shack out back, you know, it's not, not in very good condition, but it's better than just sleeping out on the, on the road. And she said, you know, I did it because of my faith, to welcome these poor people who had nowhere else to go. And then she looked at me and she said, but that was a year ago. And now there are 20 people living out back. They're relatives and friends who had no place to go. And she said, there's no water. There's no toilet. I don't know how long they'll stay. I, I can't tell them to leave. But you could tell that this initial hospitality and warmth Where's thin when there's no end in sight? And that you see in almost well, every refugee situation. Concerns about security, worry about the economic impact. You know, you get into a taxi in any country hosting large numbers of refugees, and the taxi driver will usually start to talk about, oh, those refugees, the rents are going up. You know, my, my cousin couldn't get into the hospital because the refugees were there. A lot of concerns at that popular level about the impact of refugees. Although governments rarely emphasize the positive contributions, we hear a lot about the costs of refugees, but there are clear economic winners for those who benefit from the presence of refugees, and especially when there's a lot of humanitarian aid pouring into the country. That is an economic stimulus for the economy. Then there's concern about the political impact, the social impact, uh, uh, concerns about you know, having large numbers of foreigners in the country, particularly when they don't have legal status. I mentioned camps. This is a picture of Zatari. This is an informal settlement also in Lebanon, so euphemistically called informal settlement. There aren't formal camps for Syrian refugees. I mean, most are living either with relatives, friends, those with money renting apartments, those without living under tarps or cardboard boxes. Um, protracted displacement, I think probably every refugee in the world thinks it's going to be temporary. You know, let me you know, just get out of the country for a little while until things calm down. But the typical pattern is that it lasts for years and years. The statistics are a little 
a little difficult, but we, we think that the average refugee situation lasts between 15 and 20 years. Palestinians, of course, much longer. And that's a long time to be in limbo when you don't know, will I be able to go home, if so, when? And maybe just to say a word about education, which becomes particularly important in these protracted situations. And these, this is from the UNHCR UNESCO report uh, two years ago. While 91 percent of children worldwide are in primary school, half of refugee kids are. And there I just say that you know, the Palestinian refugee kids you know, have the tremendous advantage of UNRWA and UNRWA schools where not only are um, virtually all Palestinian kids in UNRWA's areas of operation in school, but there's gender equality in terms of numbers of boys and girls. When you get to um, middle school, the figures drop more. 84% of adolescents worldwide in school, 22% of refugees. And when you get to university, you see the, the, the gap even smaller. It's really a desperate situation to talk to refugees who somehow made it through secondary school but have zero chance, zero chance of going to university. This is from Turkey and talking about the dilemmas of how do you deal with, in the case of Turkey, the need to educate a million Syrian refugee children. And according to the Syrian, well, according to academics in Syria, the cost is, is, is phenomenal. They need to build 1,300 new schools at a cost of 2.2 billion euros. Right now, the Turkish government is planning to build 200 schools, which is a big investment. Um, in terms of teachers, to hire teachers and pay them to deal with a million more refugee students is, is tremendous. For refugee education, when, when refugees are dispersed, it's hard to make sure that they're in school. You know, as Rochelle mentioned, the pressure on schools, do we double shift, do we build new schools? Well, we need those schools because eventually they're going to go home. You know, so we don't want to really invest in permanent infrastructure. Real problem with lack of teachers, problems with certifying refugee teachers. A lot of Syrian refugees are teachers, willing, able to teach, but they don't have the credentials to do so in the host country. Questions about the curriculum. Do you teach a Syrian curriculum? If so, you're indicating you expect them to return. Or do you use the national curriculum? Say, do you, and again, the language. In Turkey, they've agonized for two or three years. Do we teach the refugee kids in Arabic? or in Turkish. If we teach them in Turkish and they learn it really well, will they ever go home? You know, let's teach them in Arabic, but where are we going to find the, find the teachers? Informal schools spring, spring up everywhere. Governments don't like informal schools. There's no control over what's being taught or, or the standards of education. Um, and a lot of pressure on teachers. I remember talking with a Lebanese teacher who was I think really trying to do the right thing, who said, you know, now I've got twice as many students as I used to have. Um, my language of instruction is English and French. The, the kids speak Arabic, so I'm constantly translating for them. They're traumatized, so they're acting out and they're crying and they're bullying, being bullied by Lebanese kids. And, and they're twice as many students. And, and she said, and I don't get paid a penny more. You know, I want to do the right thing, but this is really hard. And the Lebanese parents are really concerned that their kids are being shortchanged. So it's a dilemma all the way around. And for kids, you know, most Syrian refugee kids and most refugee kids generally, they've been out of school for a couple of years or maybe longer. Do you know what it's like for a 14-year-old to go into a second grade class? So there are all kinds of problems facing the children and so on. And, and, and maybe just to end with the last dilemma also that, um, that Rochelle mentioned is that humanitarian crises don't have humanitarian solutions. You know, when the international community can't resolve a conflict from Syria, then giving humanitarian assistance is, is a, maybe a guilt reliever. Oh, we can't stop the war, but at least we can give money for refugees. We can give more humanitarian aid. But humanitarian aid over the long term is, is no solution. The only solution for places like Syria or South Sudan or Myanmar is to resolve the crisis that displaced people in the first place. Anyway, sorry to be so depressing, but, but thank you.
Does everyone hear me? Yes. So my name is Kristen Garrity Shakerji. Um, thank you so much for all being here today. It's really exciting to be on this panel, and thank you to all the organizers and the hosts for convening this important event. Um, just a quick clarification in my bio before we start. I don't um, focus on the radicalization of Muslims. I focus on the racialization of, of <laughs> Muslims. I just want to be really clear, um, because there's a lot of um, problematics with uh, using a word such as radicalization. And I'm here with um, my colleague and good friend, Azal Tarefi, and together we're going to be talking about an essay that we recently published in Al Jazeera last month on the topic of U.S. immigration history, and really kind of anchoring and framing that history with a rigorous analysis of what we argue are co-foundational frameworks of not only white supremacy, but um, Thank you. <clears throat> but of ableism as well. So analysis of, of race, also of ability and disability. And we, of course, will go through and define these terms. But um, until we do that, I just wanted to give you a brief sense of what we attempted to accomplish with our essay and what we hope to um, uh, analyze here and provide for you all today so that when you leave and go back to your classrooms and you know educating formative young minds, um, you have a good sense of perhaps how to how to address immigration and the history of immigration in such a way that is really mindful and comprehensive of not only race, but also ability and disability. So three things that I think we would really like for, for you all to leave here today. So as I mentioned um, just now, we would really like you to leave here with a really good anchoring of US immigration history as a component of race and of ability and disability. So I'm go we're going to re repeat this a lot because we want to make sure we're really comfortable with that kind of language. We also want to make sure that we, that you all leave here with a good sense of how past immigration policies, or perhaps actually not so past immigration policies, and proto-immigration policies of, of Indian removal and slavery, what they have to do with current immigration policies today. They're very structurally linked and intertwined and interwoven, and we need to make sure we have a really rigorous understanding of how, these all, how all of these policies and proto-immigration policies are connected. And then, of course, something else um, we hope that you will leave here with today is being able to identify really um, ableist language and discourses that we and that are used in the way that we talk about immigration and immigrants today. I think we have a pretty good understanding of how race and racism comes up in, in how we talk about immigrants and immigration. Our current president, in particular, makes that quite easy. Um, just last month, he referred to immigration from certain countries as, um, as shithole countries. So he's making it quite easy to identify the racism. And I think a lot of us perhaps aren't quite as familiar with, with the ability and disability component of, of that discourse. So I just wanted to kind of read, um, get a sense of the room and, and see where we're all at in terms of our knowledge of past immigration policies. So by a show of hands, if, if you don't mind, and it's totally optional. Um, so many of us are quite aware of immigration quotas in the past based, based on nationality, based on national origin. In particular, um, you know, we all are pretty familiar with a ban on Chinese nationality of the you know, Asiatic Bard Zone. But what came before national origin quotas? By show of hands, who here has heard of bans on people who are deemed to be idiots and imbeciles? Okay, not too many of us. What about bans on people who were identified to be feeble-minded and perverts? About sterilization. Banned, so they weren't permitted entry to the US. Right, so that's about five of us in this room here. So, um, and we address this very rigorously in our essays. We encourage everyone to read it. Um, there's no paywall. What about, um, in terms of, you know, we're hearing a lot of conversations today about, about Muslim <coughs> bans, and this really kind of started in January 2017 with the signing of an executive order by the president banning, um, banning immigration from seven Muslim-majority countries, as well as the refugees. But who all is familiar with um, a previous policy called NSEERS, which stands for the National Security Entry Exit Registration System? Okay, so maybe about 10 or so of us. So this was a policy that was enacted in, 2000, in 2002, yes, right after 9-11, in 2002 that banned um, 
Muslim males from 24 Muslim majority countries, and it resulted in the deportation of approximately 13,000 Muslim males. And, the, and the, the law for this policy wasn't taken off the books until December 2016. So there has been a, a, a registration system already. And then lastly, who here has heard of bans on gay people coming into this country? Okay, just a few of us. What about bans on people who are HIV positive? A little bit more, okay. So these bans were only lifted within the past three decades. The ban on gay people was lifted in 1990, and the ban on people who are HIV positive wasn't lifted until 2009. But, but then we had a waiver program in the refugee program for people with HIV um, mm -hmm. um, and AIDS, so we have to be cognizant of okay. that. Okay, great, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. So shifting then to um, kind of analyzing discourse, and especially ableist discourse, just wanted to kind of familiarize um, ourselves with the language that we're using, and uh, we're gonna make this really conversational. So we talk about things about current immigration policies today, like, like DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or TPS, Temporary Protected Status, for issues concerning diversity visas, um, family-based you know, reunification policies, otherwise rather derisively <coughs> referred to as chain migration, and, and Muslim bans. What is, what's some of the language that we're using that is quite ableist, in fact? You know, we hear things like, how much will DACA recipients benefit the economy? How much will they contribute? What is their financial worth for the economy? Or conversely, how costly will be deportation? How much will that impact our economy? Are people with, um, with TPS or are people who are, who are trying to get into this country, um, are they highly skilled? Are they bringing in things that will be re really beneficial to the economy? Are these people who are really educated? Are they um, do they speak English well? Will they provide financially for their family? Will they be dependent on, on the system? And in particular, last month when we had the State of the Union by President Trump, he talked about four pillars for his immigration reform. And I just kind of wanted to read briefly um, in full one of, the, one of the items that he mentioned in his, one of the pillars in this immigration reform that he's been putting forward, which in particular affects um, his desire to end the, uh, the visa lottery, the diversity visa lottery. And he said, it is time to begin moving towards a merit-based immigration system, one that admits people who are skilled, who want to work, who will contribute to our society, and who will love and respect our country. So again, we're tying admissibility somehow to productivity and to ability and to a lack of, a th of, of, of threat, to a lack of deviancy in some way, shape, or form. And so what is, so when, we, when we're hearing these things, let's make sure that we're able to address and identify the subtext, particularly the, the, race, the racial and racist subtext as well as the ableist subtext. And I think this would be a good time to perhaps jump into the definitions. Yes, so what Kristen is painting a picture of here and what I'd like us to frame our conversation around is an understanding that historically within the United States in particular, but also in other parts of the world, um, conversations on both sides of, of immigration policy debates have always been deeply rooted in prevailing notions and understandings of disability, of later on what would become eugenics. And so in order to really grapple with what's happening today, it is imperative then that we not just talk about um, immigration as, as these policies that are set in place, looking at, um, Rochelle spoke a lot about um, the kind of racial constructions and how that's informed policies. Well, those racial constructions were actually tied specifically to an American understanding um, of who has value and who doesn't, who's going to produce for the economy and who won't. So in doing so, let's first make sure we all understand what ableism means. What am I referring to here? Um, and so we put the definition up here and we'll refer to it throughout, throughout our presentation. But it's the oppression, prejudice, stereotyping, or discrimination against disabled people on the basis of actual or presumed disability. <coughs> so we know, of course, that national quotas were introduced um, with the Immigration Act in 1924. What I think often gets left out of that is that the, the path that led to 
quotas on the basis of nation of origin was a path that was completely marked by um, prevailing notions that certain groups who didn't fit within normative constructions of what we considered to be white um, were outside of those constructions because they had they were presumed to have defects, whether they were biological or neurological in nature. And so to give you some examples, for instance, some of the groups that were historically barred from entering the, what, the United States, Italians were considered to be dwarfish and were therefore barred entry, not just because they were Italian, but because Italians were understood to be biologically inferior. Um, Jews were considered, quote, very poor in physique, the polar opposite of our pioneer breed. And therefore, on that basis, were, were barred entry into the United States. Portuguese, Greeks, and Syrians were, quote, undersized, Slavs, slow-witted. So there, there's this characterization that certain groups that fit outside of this normative construction of whiteness, and I'll get into that, um, are defective in some way. And so we understand, I think, a lot of us eugenics to be primarily something that was accomplished through forced sterilization and mass sterilization of people who were undesirables. Well, a key component of eugenics is actually bar people from entering from the, in the first place. Don't let people who were associated with having these biological or neurological perceived defects from ever coming into the United States, ever attaining citizenship, because if you do so, then you can maintain this quote-unquote pioneer breed, and you can continue to ensure that the fundamental quality of the United States, as it was envisioned, uh, would not change and would not be threatened by this influx of people. And so it is really then primary to all immigration debates to, to have this understanding of who do we want. So we hear often President Trump talking about merit-based immigration, right? And he's like, we have to change this to a merit-based policy so that we're only bringing in the good folks. It's always been a merit-based. <laughs> it's always been based on our understandings of who's going to contribute some sort of value. So for instance, Kristen talks about um, in, in conversations about DACA um, and, and DACA recipients no longer um, having those protections. On both sides of that argument, actually, so it's interesting because we, we, there's this assumption that it's only the people who are removing these protections and rescinding TPS or temporary protected status protections and things like this, that they would be the ones that are using very racialized and ableist language. But actually, it's been on both sides. So for instance, in, in this circumstance, with with these immigration debates, you have conservatives and Republicans arguing that we can't bring these people in because they're going to be a burden, right? They're going to be an economic burden and codependent with that, that framework, they're also arguing even if they're not going to be economically burdensome, they are dangerous, right? We don't know who they are, we don't know what they're going to do, and therefore they pose a threat. And the threat is either a threat to our, our our well-being or physical safety and national security, or an economic threat, which would equally be devastating to the power of the state and the, the economy state. But on the flip side of that, arguments against lifting these, these um, TPS protections and DACA protections have also been steeped in the same kind of framework. So there, the critique wasn't grounded in, perhaps we shouldn't be basing these decisions on a, a value that we ascribe to certain minds and bodies based on where they're from and whether or not they, are, they have the ability to produce. Instead, the critiques have largely been, well, actually, there's data to show that DACA recipients have produced a lot, right? They generate a lot of wealth. So it is in our interest to actually let them stay. Or conversely, that, that even, if it's, um, even if they can't produce a ton in terms of their economic um, benefits to the state, we have a lot of data that shows that immigrants are actually less likely to commit crime than people who are born in the United States. And the problem with that framework is that it's not, there's no real critique here that we are making judgments about who can and cannot live within these borders, not based on anything beyond do they serve the United States' interests. 
And then to throw it way, way back, and I, by that I mean 1600, um, what were the frame, because we, we always hear, well, what did the founding fathers envision, right? Well, let's, let's talk about what the founding fathers envisioned. I feel like that's an important thing that we didn't really have a chance to grapple with yet today. And so very briefly, I think it's important for us to really consider that by 1680, when we have the first legislative body in what would become the United States in the colony of Virginia, they are literally arguing what does it mean to be white? Because whiteness in the United States is a legal construct. And it was a construct that we can pinpoint exactly when, when it became defined. And so what happened was citizenship became tied from that period onwards to a particular normative construction of who would be white. And that Cat that, that construction changed over time in the sense of who could um, argue that they were white and who couldn't. And this is really interesting. And Rochelle mentioned an example earlier for people who were here in the morning. But we have a lot of case law that shows people coming to what the United States and trying to gain admission and being denied it and then trying to seek relief through the courts, not by arguing, I have a right, a fundamental right to be, um, be able to move here and, and, and settle here, but that I have a fundamental right to be here because I'm white too. So many people who came, for instance, from parts of the Arab world were able to successfully resettle based on um, arguments saying, we actually fit within these normative constructions of whiteness. And in the cases of disability, which have been pervasive throughout our history and remain um, kind of foundational for immigration policies today, a similar argument was made. So there's an example of a, a gentleman who comes to, to the United States in the late 1920s. Um, he's Armenian, and he wants to seek admission. And they mark his back with L for lame. This is so people would literally be just moving through, and they would chalk on their backs L for lame or F for feeble-minded, based on what they were perceiving. Then you would be subject to additional screening. Upon that additional screening, they said, you suffer from what we call femininity. Sounds pretty devastating. Um, so he, he suffered from femininity. And they made this de de designation and said, on that basis, you can't live within the United States. And what's really remarkable is that in his arguments against this, his attorney said, well, actually, he is because he's been successful in supporting himself and, and producing a lot of money back home. So he can do that here, therefore tying his value what? to an ability to produce. So we see that ableism, white supremacy, and capitalism not only being intersecting systems, but systems that were completely dependent upon each other in determining who has value, who deserves citizenship, and who deserves to reside within these borders. And I think that should remain at the back of our minds as we're, we're kind of going through the rest of this program, because that is really at the core of all of these immigration debates and it remains a core component of the policies that are in place here in the United States today. And so when you're hearing these debates, I'd, I'd like you to think about how a lot of the language we're hearing is, is based on these, these notions of who has value, what bodies and minds have value. And I'll let you jump back in. So let's um, make sure we also define what we mean when we say white supremacy. We're not just referring to overtly white supremacist groups, which of course this does um, entail, but we mean white supremacy in a, in a more broader way as well. And we're gonna draw from some, um, a few quotes here from some uh, critical race theorists. So for example, um, one by the name of Francis Lee Ainsley defines white supremacy as a political, economic, and cultural system in which whites again with the understanding of what is the normative construction of whiteness at that particular time period, in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources. Another scholar um, by the name of Robin D'Angelo um, has argued that white supremacy defines white people as the norm or the standard for human, and people of color as an inherent deviation from that norm. So perhaps we could begin to hear that the way that race and ability or disability is, is really kind of tied and constructed in there together. Because how, 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 when we're understanding deviation, a racial deviation, there's something also constructed in there about ability and also um, threat and perversion somehow. 
And we have a few, um, we have a few pictures that we wanted to, to go through. Just to give you a sense, did you want to do this one? Sure. So this image um, actually shows uh, immigration officials that were conducting very invasive medical examinations of Chinese boys that were being detained. Um, and the way in which they did this was based on some prevailing notions of, of kind of scientific racism that was accepted as, as good science, right? And so you see he's examining the, the young man's head. Um, I know a lot of us we use the term lowbrow. That's a eugenics term, right? Um, certain racial groups were considered to be quote unquote lowbrow, as showing that they had less capacity for cognitive and, and neurological ability, and therefore were seen as defective. And this was a way in which they determined whether or not people could be allowed entry to the U.S. Sure. So this is an image here of um, kind of the blueprints <coughs> and the layout of what was called the psychopathic ward at Ellis Island. And this was a ward where we see here an image description. I'm just going to stand up because I'm off and toward it. So um, what we're seeing here is um, this construction of a facility, facility that was built in 1906 to 1907 um, that was built in order to observe and to treat immigrants deemed imbeciles, epileptics, feeble-minded, and insane. Those who they weren't quite sure should be admitted entry into the United States until perhaps they were observed and treated, or for those who um, was they were deemed inadmissible and would be shortly returned. So we've been using the terms idiot, imbecile, um, feeble-minded. All of these categorizations were categorizations coming out of the eugenics movement that um, also is the time in which we see the development of what's called mental age theory. And so these designations um, were tied to things like phrenology and, and other notions that, that sought to ascribe a person's cognitive ability based on physical and other characteristics. So you see in these images um, four different uh, men and one a young boy, each of whom were, were stamped with that categorization. So in the upper left, for instance, he was categorized as a low-grade imbecile. Um, in the right, I believe a low moron, a high-grade imbecile um, to the bottom, and then a constitutional inferior low moron. Um, and I, I, I want to really um, point out here that this is also at a time in which the United States Supreme Court upheld sterilization laws with Justice, Supreme Court Justice Oliver, Oliver Wendell Holmes saying, quote, three generations of imbeciles is enough. And this was seen as foundational and in, in our immigration policies because there was this fear that the fundamental quality of, of the country and the people who inhabit it would be threatened by people who were designated as inferior psychologically. And um, before we close, I know, Susan, um, that we're, we're running short on time, but one thing that I do also want to point out quite quickly is the, con the construction of citizenship in this country was tied to race, and it was tied to ability and disability. And we are currently in a moment where citizenship has been stripped from people in this administration, and this is something that has not garnered as much media attention as some of the other things that have been happening. Um, and I want to tie this into a conversation on, on immigration and migration because um, the, these designations of, of who have value also mean who has the ability to seek relief through the stru legal structures in this country um, and who cannot. And so a lot of the people who are disabled and do make it into the United States are currently disproportionately represented in immigration detention. And what that means is in immigration detention, uh, people who are held there are not entitled to the same legal protections that criminal defendants are, who are citizens of this country. And when you add to that that they're disabled but not entitled to the dispensations that would allow them to navigate an incredibly complex system, they are being deported by default at huge rates. And still to this day, if you're trying to come and move to the United States, you can be subject to, often are subject to, invasive medical examination. If you are suspected of becoming, um, that you could possibly become a ward of the state, so medically incarcerated, or you would, you would need um, too much in the way of resources, 
on that basis, you can be denied entry. So this isn't a historical phenomenon that, that doesn't happen anymore. And what we're seeing today is not an aberration. It is completely consistent with a longstanding policy of the United States of crafting our immigration policies on the basis of normative constructions of whiteness and how that ties into disability and also the economic um, value that people bring to the country. So we'll, we'll end it there. I got the signal from Susan.